And sometimes defending your ideas, right? Defending them in front of people, convincing them that your ideas are good. Absolutely. I feel like a big part of it is, hey, you have this ambiguous problem, right? That's the whole point of being a staff engineer. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Rahul. He's been on this channel twice before, and we are going to be talking about how to become a software engineer who makes $500,000 or more per year. What better person to join me on this topic than Rahul, who was one of these software engineers. He made more than $500,000 a year working at Facebook. In fact, he even made more than $800,000 a year. So Rahul, why don't you spill the beans? What's the secret to making that much money as a software engineer? Thanks, Clint, for having me. I think that to get to half a million a year or more in total compensation, there are two real paths to get there. Path number one is to get to a very senior level. And what I mean by that is like a staff engineer or higher at one of these top companies, like a fan company or tier one company that really pays a lot in terms of salary, equity, and bonus. And there's another path too, which is to basically be lucky and join a company which has a huge uh, equity upside and you happen to benefit from the growth of the company stock. Okay, so you're saying that there's more to making 500K a year as a software engineer than just acing your technical interviews by going to algoexpert.io and using the promo code PlanCLEM for discount on the platform. That's what I'm getting from you right now. Let's jump into that first one, the thing about being a staff software engineer or more. Staff software engineer usually being L6 or more. Can you tell us like, what is the secret that a staff software engineer has that differentiates them from lower levels that makes companies be willing to pay them that much. Absolutely. So I think that we actually talked about this in our very first collaboration two years ago. Being a staff engineer, in my opinion, is fundamentally about having more impact and more scope. Every level you get promoted, there's an expectation that the people that you're influencing not just your work, but also your team's work, maybe your whole organization's work, that should be increasing the higher up you go. And because you have more scope and more direction for the whole business, you of course will get compensated more. That's exactly how I think about it. And to be honest, I always view it from the lens of a, of a business owner or an entrepreneur, which I have been over the last few years, which is that in order to make money, which is ultimately what all of these businesses want, you must create value somewhere, whether it's for a customer or for an employee who might be themselves able to create more value for customers after and, and make more money for the company, you need to be able to create that value. And to do that, you have to have impact. And to have impact, especially greater impact, you need to have a bigger scope of work and you need to seek that out. Just as a business owner is gonna seek out a problem to solve, so too will a staff software engineer or a higher level in these companies, they will seek out a problem to solve. Is that correct? I agree, 100%. And you brought up a really good example, an analogy of being an entrepreneur, which is you know what both you and I are now. I don't know, a company called Taro. I think when you think about entrepreneurship, you're going from zero to one. You're figuring out a problem, you're tackling it, and you're bringing it to the market. And so I think even in a big company, there are tons and tons of opportunities to go from zero to one. And that's a really good way of creating scope, right? And in fact, I would say a big part of the reason why I got promoted from senior to staff during my time at Meta came from me creating an internal tool which dramatically sped up the debugability of a certain class of problems that I was working on. And if you want to hear that story, I actually recorded that and put it into the app that I'm developing called Tara, which is designed to help engineers get onboarded and promoted faster at their job. So join Tara.com. Clement, I'll ask you to leave a link for it in the description. But that was a good example of me creating scope, zero to one. There's another form of scope that is related, which is expanding scope. When you're at a big tech company, like let's say Meta or Google, obviously there's some product or maybe multiple products that have hit product market fit. There are probably billions of people or at least millions of people using that product already. That will typically lend itself to, there are probably certain things that certain users are doing which are not being done as well as they could be. So could you implement an improvement or maybe a UI change or an infrastructure change which allows the company to serve more people faster or better or cheap, more cheaply, right? And so that's another example of scope, but not inventing scope, but just expanding scope, We're going from one to 10 instead of zero to one. So both are equally viable depending on what org you're in, what team you're in in the company. But I think scope is a really fundamental part of justifying a half million dollar compensation or more. 
Exactly. I was going to say that that is how you can command so much money from these companies because you're genuinely giving them returns. One thing I want to emphasize is that oftentimes you will actually find resistance to your wanting to create scope or expand scope. And that resistance may come laterally from peers or even you know, above you, from people who are at a higher level than you, who might say, uh, you shouldn't really be doing this. You know, you should focus on smaller problems. And that can obviously be quite frustrating for someone, especially if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, and especially if you're really junior. We'll actually touch on this on a video that we made on uh, Rahul's channel, which we'll mention at the end of this video. But you really have to try to circumvent all of this resistance and stay true to your goal of expanding scope or creating scope. Yeah, and I think one way to think about it, to evaluate if you're headed in the right direction to get to a staff or equivalent level is shifting your mindset and your work from reactive to proactive, right? So if you think about the past week or the past month at your job, how much of the work you are doing was given to you by a tech lead, a manager, someone else, versus how much of it was you going out, identifying a problem, talking to a stakeholder, like another engineer or maybe someone on the customer team, whatever, and figuring out how you can solve their problem without being told exactly what to do. And sometimes defending your ideas, right? Defending them in front of people, convincing them that your ideas are good. Absolutely. I feel like a big part of it is, hey, you have this ambiguous problem, right? That's the whole point of being a staff engineer. It's not entirely clear which is the best solution. And so a lot of it is, hey, I'm going to go out and advocate for this particular solution that I can bring to market, I can actually implement. And why is that better or more cost effective or faster compared to the 10 other solutions that we could pursue, right? So I think a big part of it is for sure, like you said, defending it and marketing it and, and making it come to life with all the people in a big tech company. And if you're able to convince all these people and you end up being right that your thing created all that value, you will often be rewarded in the form of you know, cash bonuses or equity bonuses and therefore increased compensation. I will also say that oftentimes, like, and I think we're talking about this in the framing of like conflict of like, oh, people don't want you to do it and you're going to kind of uh, win the argument and, and still pursue this thing. At most of these big tech companies, there are more problems to go around than there are people to solve them. And so oftentimes it just requires being a little bit creative and identifying a problem or a space which is not really being thought about enough. And you might find that there's plenty of scope, plenty of opportunity to have an impact without needing to trample over people, right? I'll give you a concrete example. When I was working at Meta, on the Android team, we use a build system called Buck. So people might have heard of Gradle or Bazel. We use something called Buck at Meta. And there's a notion of an EXO package. And an EXO package is like a modified shell version of an Android app that doesn't require building the whole thing. And so if anyone here works at a big tech company, one of the things that you'll get frustrated with very quickly is it takes like literally three or four minutes to rebuild your Android app. And so the EXO package is a really amazing thing which allows you to reduce the build time dramatically. And so one really good example of a staff engineer behavior is there was someone on my team who basically dug into the documentation and figured out how can she enable the EXO package build on our team. And all of a sudden, it went from a four minute, five minute build to a 30 second build. And the thing that's magical about that is that it's not just about her getting her work done faster, right? It was actually the whole team, 10, 20, 30 engineers, all of a sudden benefited dramatically from her ingenuity and her simple act of like going through the documentation. And that's really another characteristic, which is multiplicative impact instead of additive impact. Not just like doing one feature at a time, one bug fix at a time, but having a higher level perspective and thinking about how can the work I do benefit not only me, but the entire team, the entire org of people I work with. Absolutely. And I think that sometimes this impact can take the form of technical impact or non-technical impact. For example, even in this story that you shared, there's a component that is technical, which was you know figuring out how to make that tool or what have you, you know, that made the build faster. But then there was also this component of persuading other people that this was even worth investigating in the first place, or perhaps persuading them to use this new system, which is a little bit non-technical, or perhaps convincing a team to have fewer meetings that may end up saving time for the team and therefore saving money for the team. So I think we've touched a lot 
on what it really means to be a staff software engineer that commands half a million uh, dollars a year or more, or a higher level engineer. But what about this sort of luckier uh, way to make that much money that you mentioned at the beginning? I will say that luck plays a big role in everyone's career. Like the 800K number, TC, that you mentioned at the beginning, that is what I earned in 2021 from my time at Meta. But the reason I was able to get that is during my time at the company, the Facebook or Meta stock did grow. It almost doubled or more than doubled in stock value. And so, of course, I think I was a beneficiary of that, which inflated my TC more than if I had interviewed and joined directly. But that principle is what we're talking about. Another very common way, I would say, for people who make that much money is they join a company which does really, really well in the two, three, four years after they join, right? So NVIDIA is a good example, right? I was looking at the stock of NVIDIA. In the past five years, they have gone up about 400%, right? So if you got 100K of equity initially, it's now 400K. And similarly, that story has been repeated again and again and again. That's the whole magic of Silicon Valley is that you join a company, it goes public, and then all of a sudden your equity is worth 10X. And so even if you're like a mid-level engineer, you could end up making more than half a million a year simply because you're at a company or in a market where everyone is growing like crazy. Absolutely. And depending on how lucky you are, you could even be an entry-level engineer. Your first job out of college or out of a boot camp, you fall in a company that truly does the magic 10x in a few years, and there you go, you're making half a million, if not more, like a million a year, just because of that stock appreciation and everything. And so I think this is going to wrap it up on how to become a 500k or more a year engineer. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, Rahul. We filmed another video on your channel channel about why so many software engineers who work at Fang companies leave, including us. We were both at Fang and we both left. I'll put the link to that video in the description and in the comments below. Don't forget to check it out. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter if you enjoy short form and content, Instagram if you like pictures, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.